The Internet of Things makes it possible that all kinds of devices exchange information. Software can be on our clothes, on our body, and even in our body. According to Jan Rabai, the human will be the core of the next wave of computing. Jan Rabai teaches at the University of California at Berkeley, where he is the founding director of Berkeley Wireless Research Center and Swarm Lab. He is an IE fellow and received honorary doctorates from London, Antwerp, and Tampere. Jan Rabai. <laughs> Good afternoon. True pleasure to be back in Antwerp and to talk about some of the things I've been musing about for the last, let's say, five years or so. Think about it. Humanity has been evolving over the last hundreds of thousands of years. We have been adapting to changes in environment, challenges, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of things that tell me that we're at a point again that humanity is going to move towards a new direction, make a new step in its evolution. And there's a couple of reasons why we think so, why we believe that is going to be the case. Let's see. We are starting to live in a smart world. You've all heard about smart things, smart tools, smart cars, smart grids, whatever. It's all, everything is going to become smart. It is really, really happening. And it's just the beginning. Actually, in the next couple of years, this smart world will become a lot more dynamic. Things will be moving around us. We have groups of drones. We have robots doing certain tasks. We have groups of robots working together. And we have smart traffic. Cars basically interacting with each other on interaction without traffic lights and so on and so forth. Amazing things, but very scary. A lot of us are asking ourselves the question is, how will we as humans live in a world like this? How will we cope with all of this? And to me, there's only one answer. There is only one possible answer and that is, to adjust the same technologies that are created at Smart World to evolve. So the next evolution of humanity. Now the question is, what could that look like? What does it mean? To do so, it's probably worthwhile to think a little about what it means to be a human. Um, so if you think about it, our human body has a number of modalities. We have a capability, let's see if this works. We have a capability of sensing, interacting with the environment. We have five to seven sensors, depending upon who you talk to, that collect information about the world around us or what is happening in our body. That information is then sent to our central computer, the brain, that interprets it, classifies it, thinks about it, learns about it, and ultimately performs actions. Performs actions, performs stimulations, interact. For instance, speaking is a perfect example of this. Now, the question is, what can we do to improve on this? Obviously, over all those ages, we have been using tools as humans to do things better. Again, way back, hundreds of years, we discovered that tools are a means of that. But it's something that's external to us. It's something that is not part of our humanity, human being. So one option to say is to address this is to say, well, I can wear devices. Wearable computing is something that is making a lot of impact today. And the concept in principle is very similar to the behavior of our human. We basically have a set of sensors that we carry on us in our clothing, in our cell phone, you name it. That information is now sent to a physical computer, be it a cell phone, a watch, or whatever it is, that interprets it, classifies it, and potentially 
learns something from it, and ultimately performs action, like projecting again onto our normal senses, how we see, what we hear, and so on and so forth. Amazing technology. We can do many, many things with this. We can peer inside our human body using medical sensors and see how we are performing when we're pressing ourselves. We can augment hearing. We can augment seeing, like AVR and so on and so forth. So many, many interesting things are emerging. Can you imagine that I have a device that I put in my ear and that would translate any single language you hear on the fly? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Well, that technology is basically there and will be available very soon to come. So again, the same picture. But there's one thing that's additional to this. While our human body is an isolated entity, and we have to use our motor control to act with other people, this device is connected to the internet or to the cloud. We can transmit information of what we see and hear, or we can get information back from other people that basically are present in the cloud. So that's a big addition to the overall system. But again, it's all about the same thing. It is about observation, measuring. It is about interpretation and learning. And it's about acting and stimulating. The big challenge still with this, though, is that the technology is still complementary to our human body. Let's see. Some. It is complementary. It's still not part of ourselves. So what would it take? Well, there's one missing link. The missing link is this. If I could create a connection between our biological computer we all carry with us, which is an amazing machine, and your portable electronic device, your physical computer, you could link them together. We call this brain-machine interfaces. And uh, this is a topic of very active research. There's actually research in academia. There's a set of startup companies that are getting very actively involved in this area. But when you do so, you can do some interesting things. Because now, both of those machines can interact. They can learn on their own. They can talk to the cloud. So suddenly, we as a human are connected to the rest of the world through a link. And we can do interesting things. Like the picture, the video you see on top is a paraplegic woman that has a brain implant, reading signals from her brain, transmitting them, and they're allowing her to spell words on a screen quite rapidly. And you can imagine that that same technology could allow you to remove a prosthetic arm, a exoskeleton, and so on and so forth. So that's an interface directly into the central neural system. But you can imagine that that doesn't have to be that direct. You can think about the peripheral neural system, or you can even use indirect signals like EMG, like in the bottom movie, to control a drone by just using gestures. So symbiotic computing, where we now have two things, a physical computer and an organic computing working together. This is the loop on how such a system works. As I said, there are basically two computers now interacting and learning from each other. And in between, we have sensing modalities, things that learn and read neural signals, things that allow us to basically manipulate the nervous system, provide feedback, and actually create closed-loop system. Because closed-loop is actually very important for this. So you can imagine, if this is possible, the opportunities are humongous. Think about dictating email by just thinking through it as an example. But there's many other opportunities to think about. Now, what does it take? What does it take to make such a system, which right now is sitting in a lab, turn it into something that every one of us could wear and have with us? Actually, before I go there, one more point. If you have that system that I was just describing, your brain interface system, and you have that cloud connection, thing like that, you know, you can imagine that multiple humans can be connecting and sharing thoughts. Or as I, as a human, can interact with the robots we just saw in one of the previous talks. So you start being connected as a human in a more global world. So again, what does it take? Uh, what it takes is the capability of bringing all those modalities together 
in a seamless fashion. In a way that it's something that doesn't encroach on us, in a way that doesn't hamper us, something that you basically almost feel like it's disappearing. And it has to be open. Closed platforms never work in the end. I cannot imagine having a complete system around my human body only run by one single company. That's definitely not a option at all. So looking at a open platform that allows us to connect many devices in, around, and inside or, or on our human body to perform new and exciting capabilities. I call it the human intranet, a network that basically spans the human body and allows us to act sensing modalities, actuation modalities, computation, networking, you name it, in a seamless fashion. Similar to what we did with the internet in the past and nowadays with wireless local networks and so on and so forth in more recent years. Now, building such a thing comes with quite a bit of challenges. Uh, we're not there yet. There's a lot of things to be done. First thing, obviously, as I already said, such a network, such a system should be unobtrusive. It is something that I should not be aware of. It should complement my human body. So, fortunately, technology is presenting some amazing advances. We have now computers that are about the size of a cubic millimeter. We can make particles of about 100 micron that are basically embedded either in our human body or brain and so on and so forth that actually can directly talk to biological cells, directly talk to neurons, read out neurons. We have flexible technologies you can put in your clothing, on your arm. You can imagine even smart tattoos that have some sensing or compute capabilities. So technology evolution is there and is basically, I don't think, the business hurdle. We will see this type of function happening. There's, however, bigger problems that we need to resolve. That computer I was talking about has to be very smart. It has to be able to look at all those signals that I'm getting from those sensors or from the environment around me and make sense of them. Make sense of them, translate them, them learn over time what to do with it, adapt, and so on and so forth, because things change. And it has to learn how to work together with our biological computer. This is not easy. And uh, it requires tons of computations. It has to be quick. Anything we do with our body typically requires response times of about 10 milliseconds. Anything slower than that is not acceptable. And as I said, it has to be really tiny. If you use current day computers, they're basically humongous. By no means can I have a device like that implanted, let's say, somewhere in my body, or wearing it as a bangle, or as a wristwatch, or anything like that, or potentially in my shoes. So we need to make progress in computing. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of work happening in machine learning. There's a lot of work happening in artificial intelligence. These are in artificial intelligence systems. The problem with those devices, they're sitting in data centers, somewhere at Google, Facebook, Amazon, you name it. They're huge, they're humongous, they compute, they consume hundreds of watts. Our total brain only consumes 20 watts to do all the tasks we're doing. So we have to make them small and low power. Major progress there required. Fortunately, there's things happening. People are starting to think about machine learning engines that you actually can make very small, that are very low power, that potentially could be integrated into our system. So, a um, lot of advantages there. The only problem, though, is that those systems, as they stand, today primarily are based on deep learning networks. They're actually only what we call execution engines. The learning is done somewhere else, let's say at Google or Amazon. That doesn't work for us. I want to have experiences where I can see something and learn very quickly and react to that. So we need machines, compute engines that can learn very quickly, are very small and very low power. Again, there's hope. There's a lot, we talk a lot about the end of Moore's law. Moore's law is stopping and ending until like that. 
I don't believe that any of this is true. We have tremendous opportunities using new devices, 3D integration of technology and transistors together on top of each other to create amazing engines that are going to be cubic millimeters in size and only going to consume hundreds of microwatts, something that can be run from scavenged energy. So for example, here is a machine that can actually can quickly learn. It's a one-shot learning engine, and then itself basically takes a very small volume. Now, we have the devices, small devices. We have the computing capability. The other missing piece is how do you all connect them together? As you know, in our human body, functionality is located in different places. Sensing is done all over our body. Information is sent through initially to your peripheral neural system and then finally ends up in your brain, your central neural system, and then goes back. We have an amazing network. It's called our nervous system. It is amazingly connected, transmits information back and forth. We also have an, an energy delivery system. A capillary system or vascular system provides energy to all those devices spread around our body and basically allow us to move and do various things. So all the systems we're talking about by nature are going to have to be distributed. It's not going to be like sitting in a single cell phone that you can do all those functions. No, the sensors might be in your brain, might be on your body, might be in your shoes. Same thing with the exoskeletons, the, the prosthetic arms, and so on and so forth. As you can see in this picture, where you see actually an example of a distributed uh, control system where a arm gesture is controlling a prosthetic arm. So we need to build networks. Networks around the human body that are complementary to our nervous system that allow us to translate or transfer information from point A to point B. That's not easy because our body is always moving. If I put a sensor on my arm and I try to transmit something on my back, my arm is moving. The channel, the information flow between the two is changing continuously with huge amounts. So trying to create something that's robust and effective is really hard. So how to deal with that? Well, we can learn from how we built the internet. We can learn how we built IoT networks. All those type of things have learned those capabilities to build robust, efficient networks. So from a human perspective, if I look at my body right here, we can see there's opportunity to have a number of what we call access points. Not one, because if that fails, you're basically done. You can have them on your wrist, you can have them on your belt, you can have them on a necklace, and as I already said, in the shoes, because the shoes are the place where we have most of the energy harvesting capability of the whole body. And then those networks then can be supplemented with little sensors that are basically on your skin or basically below the skin or on your clothing, whatever basically it is. So you create a mesh networking, net mesh networking spanning your body, just like we have done with our nervous system. Now, this, however, is more complex than your traditional IoT and internet thing because transmitting something to skin or sending something through the body is very different than transmitting something to the air. So the means of communication might be very different from what the modalities you're typically used to. It could be electromagnetic, it could be ultrasound, it could be magnetic capacitance, all those type of things are options that we use to communicate in and around the body. So we need to build electronic systems that can deal with all those modalities simultaneously. Now, again, what I showed you here is what I believe is true, is that technologies for all those type of things are basically lining up. We can build small computers, we can build small sensors, we can build energy harvesting devices, we can build networks. However, there's another set of challenges that needs to be overcome. And I think they're even more formidable and really are going to be essential if technologies like this are going to be ever successful. Safety. Anything that basically threatens human life has to be extremely safe. It has to be secure. You don't want to have anybody hacking into your brain or taking over your brain functionality. Privacy. Very important topic, um, 
And last but not least, ethics. What are you allowed to do? Now, fortunately, we're not the first ones to think about this. In 1942, Isaac Asimov wrote his first book, and uh, the, I robot basically, and created the three laws of robotics. The three laws that define how robots should behave. Now, since then, there's a bunch of variants. And obviously, the system we're building are a lot more complex than the robots that Isaac Asimov was considering. But this is something that we, as a society, have to start about thinking about today. Systems will be there. We better have a solution today. That's the challenge out for us. It's a, so I believe we have a formidable future in front of us. There are a lot of interesting opportunities, but also amazing challenges. Thank you.